afternoon. One or two. All right, I'm going to try to talk like this. If you, if you can't hear me or can't understand me, tell me, and I'll wander back up to the microphone. Those of you that saw me in the morning for the soybean session know that I, I'd just rather walk around like this anyhow and have a conversation. And so as we go through this as well, I'll, I'll repeat that part of it. Folks, if I get through five slides or 50, it doesn't really matter to me. I'd much rather have a conversation with you than I would be up here just talking and only talking. So feel free to fire away on that. Uh, I think we've got a lot of similarities between what we do in Kentucky, probably what you deal with here. And so we'll talk about some of those as we go through this and give us some background on this. You guys know who I am already, so we'll skip this. If you need another website to go to, we've got the Grain Crops Extension website, which is basically our, it, it basically funnels in all the information that we've got at the university and then some neighboring places as well in terms of managing whether it's wheat, corn, soybeans, uh, grain sorghum, some things like that. We've got a grain crops update, which is a blog. It, it serves as our newsletter. And so you can follow that. You can put in your email address. It'll send you an email back confirming that it was you and that you do want to do this. And then once you've clicked yes to that, you'll start getting emails. Whenever we put a new post up, you get an email. Uh, it's probably the number one way our farmers keep track of us. And a lot of them are reading this in between the end rows when RTK is activated and they're bored. So anyway, and then finally, you can, if you really wanted to, you could follow me on Twitter at Kentucky Crops. And uh, most, of that, most of that's going to be just crops oriented stuff. You're not going to see pictures of my kids or things like that on there unless they happen to be the ones in the cornfield that I'm working in or something like that. But at any rate. So that's what a lot of our wheat fields look like in Kentucky. I imagine not much different than what you deal with here. We've got a lot of gently rolling soils, uh, sod waterways, things like that are, are very common to see as well. And because it is getting later in the day, I thought I'm going to start with some key numbers right off the bat. And so for us, if we're looking at what the crop needs throughout the season, these are some of the key numbers that we see that it needs. Uh, we'd like to see 25 plants per square foot. We'd love that number to be closer to 30. But that's our, that's our lower threshold limit, is 25 plants per square foot. And I am using square foot, and not, uh, not a square yard uh, on this. Tillering, 70 to 100 tillers per square foot. We use, that, if we're doing things right, we use that number to adjust our two nitrogen applications, our late winter and our, our early spring application. We'll adjust that based off of those numbers. Heading, 60 to 70 heads. And then ideally 35 spikelets on those heads. And so for us, when we're counting heads, we'll probably only count the ones that have at least 35 on them when we're going through to see whether or not we have an adequate population out there. And so those, for us, those are some key numbers. I don't, those of you in the, in the room here, are these pretty comparable with the numbers that you deal with? One or two say yes, okay. We'll assume the rest of you said so. All right. What's that? We didn't plant thick enough? Oh, okay. Some folks are trying to come back from that. Okay. No, that's for us, that 25 plants per square foot, that's the lower end of where we'd want to be. 30 to 35 is what we would we'd say for no till, it's where we'd be more comfortable being at when we're looking at initial emergence. Okay, all right, so just, I'm going to show you some wheat yields out of Kentucky, and I've got, I got some Maryland yields in here just to compare where we are. And we're fairly close overall, but if we look at uh, Kentucky average wheat yields, 1954 to 2014, we were at, uh, we're, we've been yielding at about 0.78 bushels per acre per year over that time frame. If you look at 1974 to 2014, it's 0.98, so we're almost at a bushel a year over the last 40 years. In that scenario, if you look at the last 10 years, uh, we're a little bit over a bushel, 1.14 bushel per acre per year. And we've had, you can see here, we've got a 75 and a 71, and those are two of our best yields, statewide average yields ever, uh, 75, 71. So unusual two years for us. Really, really, last year was our best year for corn, wheat, and beans. This year, one of our second best for wheat, probably probably going to be our best for beans. We haven't, don't have them all in yet, and probably in the top five for corn for us. And so 
getting two of those years back to back like that. Now 2012, 2012 was our worst drought in 40 years. And so it was by far one of our worst years ever. Uh, and so, uh, you know, where, what does that mean going forward? Hopefully that means we're on a new trend and <laughs> gonna have some good weather. All right, if we look at Maryland though, Maryland over that 1994 to 2014, 0.56 bushel per acre. And if we go and look at just the last 10 years, the, uh, you can see the yield increase isn't quite as strong. But part of that is, is you had a slightly higher yield that first year of this 10 year cycle, and then your yield isn't quite as good in the, the last two years as where we are. And so, but I think all things considered, our yields are fair for a statewide, our statewide yields are fairly close to each other, which means we're probably seeing some similar things in our environments. Okay, so huge gains in corn and soybeans, wheat, not as much. And so I've got the question up here, why not? Why do we see lower wheat yields or wheat gains? What's that? Okay, maybe not, not as many varieties, not as much research going into it relative to corn and beans. It's a good comment. What else? Disease. Disease. Y'all have head scab? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, what else? It, and you might say that that disease issue ties back into the varietal research issue, right? Because a lot of our corn and bean hybrids have got some pretty good tolerances now. What's another comment? Genetics, okay. Okay, what else? Yeah, in the back. Workload. Okay, logistics. Hmm, I made a mistake and bit into a piece of ice. Whew. Might have to go to the dentist in the morning. All right, next question. And the next, next comment then. Workload. Logistics is one of them. All right, I'll, I'll ask you one, take you back into your college classes talking about biology or even a high school biology class in some cases now. Soybeans and corn are both known as diploids. Wheat is a hexaploid. Now, can someone explain that? So I'm not sure I can, so. Everybody just blank stares, okay. What that means in the layman's term is corn and soybeans are much, much easier to work with genetically than wheat. Wheat is much more complex to work with genetically than corn and soybeans. Uh, because you've got three potential, well, I wouldn't go down that track. Wheat's much more complicated to work with. Another issue, when do you plant your wheat? October. October. Some of it's still got to go in yet, right? One or two fields. Okay. And when do you normally harvest? July? June, July? That wheat's going through seed fill basically late spring, early summer. For us, our springs are pretty variable. I don't know if you're all kind of all over the place, right? can be all over the place. And so I think that's an issue as well. I think just the fact of when that crop goes through seed fill, trying to get it harvested, I think those are issues that play into what make wheat a little more of a challenge. And if you look state, or if you look nationwide, so, you, so we're talking about soft red. It's what you all grow, it's what we grow. But if we look at the hard red regions of the, of the country, if we lump that in, if we lump in even the Pacific Northwest where they get some really good yields, if we lump those in, overall wheat still just does not yield as well as corn and soybeans in terms of gains over time. And I think those are some of the reasons that go into it. Okay, uh, I, I did, for those of you that saw the soybeans presentation, you saw a similar set of, of points. And I'm gonna hit these, some of these are similar, some are not. Productive soils, deep, adequate fertility, no compaction. And the other thing I should put up here, for, for us, well-drained. For us, wheat on a poorly drained field is high risk. And only, only, only when the prices of wheat are really, really good do farmers consider putting those kind of fields into wheat. Um, more times than not, if those fields harvest wheat, that wheat was put out as a cover crop, and it came spring, the price went up, the stand looked good, and so it became a grain crop instead of a cover crop. 
That's the most common scenario we see wheat on a poorly drained field for us. Adequate timely rainfall, good genetics, rotation, planting on time, a little bit late. For us, uh, October 10th to October 30th is our ideal time to plant wheat in the state by, based on the calendar. But if we're in the first two weeks of November, we're not too worried about it. And so in general, planting late doesn't matter too much. Now last year, last year late planting got us. We had had our coldest winter we've had in about 15 years. It's like we may be on track for another one again this year. Um, and that stuff that got in the ground late, it, it, it basically got that big, and then it saw 20 degree temperatures for about 15 days. And that, ooh, that's a good comment, that's what it said. Uh, and so we had some pretty reduced stands as a result of that with the late planted stuff. Stuff that went in on time, it did okay. Looked terrible for a while, but it did okay. And so some other things in here, narrow rows, seven and a half inches or less. There's some data out of Del Marva that says four inches is even better. That data is in tilled wheat fields, con conventional till fields. Uh, splitting our nitrogen rates in the spring, which I understand most of the folks in here do that as well on intensively managed wheat. Uh, capturing 95% sunlight, excellent weed control, scouting for diseases and pests, and then spraying if needed on, on those situations. Okay, so that's my list. What am I missing? I'm in your area, so what am I missing? About to call my controller, I was right. Then I'll be wrong, but anyway. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, re I'll repeat your question a little bit for everybody else. So he's asking, got some fields, really good corn yields. Corn may have been short on in because of the season. Wheat's coming up and it looks deficient, is what you're saying, or it looks uneven and things. And so what about that? So my, have y'all done the, the uh, nitrate test in the soil? It'd be the first question. So look at, and is it, is it low? I just still harvesting, yeah, you, like us, still harvesting corn. What do you mean, do a side trip? Yeah. All right, so the, the, the short answer to that, since I'm not the soil fertility guy, I can give you an answer on it. The short answer is those are fields that would be a good candidate for a fall shot of in. That's the short answer. The right answer is do the nitrate test and then make the application that way. Okay. Other questions? It's a good question. I'll, I'll go back and say two years ago. Two years ago, 2012, was our worst drought. We've got silt loam soils. Most of our, and some of those surfaces are pretty short, but they're mostly silt loam soils. And so we had a full dose of nitrogen out for the corn crop. We had no water. And so we had corn crops. 2012 was a year when we had soybean fields that beat corn. I had, I had, a, I had a test plot of 75 bushel beans and 50 bushel corn right across the road. From it. And so in a year like that, it's just the opposite. I mean, we told farmers, hey, there's a whole lot of in left over in that field. Definitely don't do anything in the fall. And come spring, pull a nitrate test. Let's see what happens. And uh, a, a lot of folks did, and they adjusted accordingly. They, they didn't even do the, the first winter application. They waited and just did a second application um, at, at Feeks 5. The folks that didn't, I passed one of those fields. We've got, we got quite a few uh, Amish and we got quite a few Mennonites in some pockets in the state. I drove by one field and I thought, huh, I didn't know Amish farmed that field. And I couldn't figure out why they had put it in shocks when it was still green. I got closer to it and what had happened was the wheat had all fallen over. And where it had fallen up against each other, it looked like shocks in the field. And so that's a scenario where that's a scenario where they didn't do the nitrate test, 
they didn't look at last year's corn crop and they went and put nitrogen on and so then they had that to contend with. So that's a really good comment. Others, am I, am I gotta be missing something, right? Seeding rate fungicides. Seeding rates, uh, we, we tend to say about 1.25 million seeds per acre, somewhere in that ballpark. That's, that comes out to about, uh, what is that, 30 seeds per square foot, 30 to 35 is what we're trying to drop most of the time. Um, and, and we may go a little bit higher than that in some, some of the no-till. Uh, the fungicide question, I've, I've got scouting for diseases and pests. Um, and so the fungicide for us would fit into that category. Yes, sir. What about just when we talk about the intelligence that we all have? Are we going to be looking at some house baits? Yeah. Some of this to try to eliminate some of those issues and push them in stuff pretty hard. Right. So, what about putting on palisade, something like that, that will reduce the risk of it falling over if we get too high of an end rate? What about that? And um, we've got some limited data on it ourselves. Uh, some of it, is some of our best wheats we wheat yields we've had, but we've also gotten some really good ones without it. Um, we uh, it appears like it may help a little bit with some lodging issues, but I I still don't think we can get crazy. With we can't really be pushing nitrogen way way high and put this on and hope that it's going to make a benefit. But yeah, yeah, that's an option. That's an option. To try to prevent the lodging. What about pulling tissue samples? I think overall tissue samples are a good idea um, as long as we keep in context what we've got in the field at the time. And so this makes wheat another challenge because if you have excessively wet weather, it can throw off the tissue sample. If you have excessively dry weather, it can throw it off. If you have cold weather, it can throw it off. Well, that's, that pretty much describes our wheat season that we deal with. And so as long as you know the conditions when you pull the sample, I think it's very good very good option for us. Did I see one other hand? Or is that just somebody saying, please move on? All right, all right, we'll go on. Okay, so let me, let's, let's uh, tell you what, I wanna skip this. Other than just to say, uh, if folks are looking to skimp, we're looking at a wheat crop, maybe I'm gonna, maybe I'm gonna skimp on that. If you're doing a soil test and the soil test needs you, says you need a certain amount of fertilizer out there for us, the university, we have our own soil testing lab, we have our recommendations and guidelines, and for whatever reason, you can send our samples to other labs, and how do I say this? For the unit, if you're following university guidelines, you'll be applying a little bit less fertilizer than if you follow one of the companies, all right? And so in a year like this, you need to, as a baseline, at least be following our guidelines, not, be, not going below those. Uh, this isn't a year, you, Mathematically, you can't grow the crop without the fertility out there. That's, that's a different way of saying that. Okay. Uh, I put this up just as, as a case in point. For us, a 300 pound per acre of K2O, that triggers an application of potassium for wheat that doesn't, for wheat where the residue stays on the field. If your soil test was 290, or 295, which meant you're just below that threshold and it triggered the application, well, that might be the one field I'd be tempted to maybe, maybe hold back my fertility application on that field, maybe. But that's pound per acre, pound per acre. All right, you follow me on that? But if, but if my soil test value is 200 pound per acre, then I need the fertility. I need to be adding that fertility out there. Uh, we, do we have some folks that are, are bailing up either barley or wheat for straw? Got a few heads nodding. Okay. We have a little bit of a demand for it in our area. We've got horses over our way. We've got some expensive, expensive horses over our way. Um, the, uh, the first house we lived in was in a small subdivision, and the backyard was up against one of the horse farms. Beautiful farm. And the real estate agent said, well, that... So the queen's got horses over there. And being kind of smart, like I was like, Queen Latifah? <laughs> she goes, no, no, the queen of England. She wasn't amused at all. And so she said, no, the queen of England. And I said, well, okay, that, nice story. Uh, that's a, one way to sell a house, I guess. 
And uh, about a month later, I was talking to the dean of our college and told him where we were living. He goes, oh, next to the Queen's Horses. I said, well, that's real. He said, oh, yeah. Yeah, she's been over once or twice and got horses right there. So anyhow, the Queen of England's got horses in that area. The Prince of Dubai, now the King of Dubai, owns four farms in the area. Uh, we've got horses, and they have a demand for straw. And so we've got a good market for straw in our area. But I will say this. It's really hard. When you look at fertilizer prices, and you look at what's being pulled off of the field in terms of just the fertilizer value, not accounting for the organic value, just the fertilizer value, it's really hard to make that baled straw pay unless you're selling the high-end straw directly into the horse market. It's really hard. It, a lot of folks in our area need to do pencils, get their pencils out and really look at what they're losing in terms of crop removal, tissue removal on that. All right. I guess maybe I said it the wrong way. I guess if, you, if you're one of the folks in the room that does sell fertilizer, you should encourage more of it <laughs> from that standpoint. Okay. All right. Uh, for us, no-till, long-term studies, we do corn, wheat, double crop soybeans. Corn, wheat, double crop soybeans. Three crops in two years. And for us, if we do all three crops in no-till, we get a slight advantage on our corn and beans. It's not much, but it is a slight advantage on yield on those crops, and we're saving a tremendous amount in labor and fuel cost going across the field. But a lot of our growers are now going back in with vertical till implements, doing some light tillage, trying to get wheat established that way. I assume that's the same we're dealing with over this way. Okay. All right. And so probably no different. Our folks are under a mad dash to get wheat out as quickly as possible put the soybeans in. They're not opposed to putting a dryer on the wheat to get the wheat dried down, to get it out just a little bit earlier. Uh, uh, our market for wheat is probably different than yours in that most of our wheat, our good wheat, is going to go into the food market. We've got some milling companies there in the state that will, will uh, sell it to, uh, well, one of, the, one of the biggest buyers of our wheat ends up being Walmart at the end of the day. It's not, not their brand directly, but what they're buying uh, if you're eating a biscuit at a McDonald's east of the Mississippi, it started out in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. And so, so we do have some demand for wheat over, over in our way on that regard. And so what happens is the, the, the larger operators, the guys and gals that are able to, to flip new machinery every year, what they're doing is they're, they're holding on to last year's combines through wheat harvest, picking up this year's combines, and so they're doubling their combine capacity for wheat harvest. And so this operation here is running six right now. They've got three in this particular field, but they're running six total to get that wheat out. And I'm sure that's probably similar to what you all deal with. They won't be doing that next year because of the because of machinery price and where things are. So it'll be, it'll be an interesting demand on our, on our harvesting for next year. And then so it's very common for us to see a soybean planter and a, and a combine in the field at the same time. I see some heads nodding on that. So we're all under the same boat. Somebody said logistics earlier there in the back, and that's a, that's a huge one. That is huge. Everything we deal with. So, all right, let's, let's get in, scoop it into this. We've got a wheat yield contest. This goes from 2008. The, the data I'm showing you is 2008 to 2014. We have six winners every year, two state winners, and then four regional winners. Uh, and these are looking at the, the practices over that time frame. 97% use a foliar insecticide. Our biggest insect problem we deal with year in and year out is aphids. And for us, there's a very, very low threshold at which we spray for aphids. And that means you've got to unroll the wheat plant in the wintertime when it's small to find those critters. They're hard to find. It's very easy to come out of a field thinking you're OK. And then later in the season, see barley yellow dwarf show up because you missed the aphids. <coughs> and so a lot of our folks just simply they spray the insecticide. Foliar fungicide, that's a bit skewed for this data. If we've got really good weather for wheat yields, what does that mean for diseases? Right? These are all fields that are high candidates, that are high risk for disease level, and so we're going to have a foliar fungicide go on these fields. Most of the time, these are single shots. They're targeting head scab most of the time. On occasion, we'll have something earlier go on to maybe pick up rust or something like that. But most of the time, a single shot. Split nitrogen, most of the fields are. Three-quarters are going to fall in. May or may not be needed. We can discuss that later. 
Most of them are doing nine rows. The other 6% are doing 15 inch rows. And so we've got some folks doing some wide rows. And then only half are doing no tillage. I should back up. 97% said they're doing a herbicide. I think, I think one or two folks just didn't fill out the form. All of our folks are using a herbicide. On yes, the, sir. On the SCAD application, what kind of window do you have in filing? How long, how many days do you have like before you get that? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. So he's asking, what kind of a window do you have? If you've got SCAD showing up, you're trying to, trying to handle that, what's your window? Most of those uh, fungicides, if I'm saying this right, they basically are targeting that early flowering. So when you first start to see some anthers show up in the, basically the middle of the head, you've got to go at that point. And so your window is about a three-day window. That's not very big. Not very big at all. So, yeah, yeah, that's pretty tight. So you can see there'd be, a, there'd be an opportunity in there to get it timed wrong. Yeah. Okay, only half our producers are doing no-till. Why is that? I think this is the issue here. They're concerned about that residue. They're growing high-yield corn. If things work out right, it's BT corn typically. Um, and so we don't have the stock breakdown we used to have, but it's, it's compounded. We don't have the stock breakdown, but we also have a lot more biomass out there because our yields are better. And so one way to get around this issue is to grow low yielding corn, which nobody wants to do. <laughs> you, you laugh about that. We've got a few growers that will put their, the ones that were actually following the refuge, which is very few, but they would grow the non-BT corn in the fields where they were going to target for wheat or they would go go with an earlier maturing hybrid and maybe try to capture some some late market value you know some old market value something like that they would do one of those things and put their wheat in those fields so they were trying to manage the residue that way but if the yields go higher this residue issue is a bigger and bigger problem um, at the same time while there's this perception out there that we just can't get as high of a yields in our no-till wheat as our conventional till wheat this is a graph looking at the highest yield in the state for the contest, in the contest study. The blue is no-till, the red is tillage. And just so happened that the same year, we got our highest yields ever in the contest at 130 and 124. And it just happened that that particular year, that 130 was a dairy farm no-till field. Now, it was following corn for grain, not corn for silage. Somebody in the last group picked up on that and had a really good question. But the point with this is, is no-till can be every bit as competitive. From the data that we see on a regular basis, no-till is still very, very competitive. Now, before I get to the cookie. So, what I've been told, previous group, there is a lot more vertical tillage going on. Is that correct? Why? That's due management, okay? What else? That, that it? Good point. Good point. We don't have that law yet. So. That's, Josh promised if we hired him, he'd keep it, keep it out. <laughs> yeah. Didn't tell us that part of the deal. <laughs> okay, that's a really good one. We, we've got our number one industry is poultry. If you look at just gate receipts, it's our number one industry. And so for us, We've got more and more poultry that are going on, and incorporation is a good point, really good point. So there's some good reasons why the, the stuff's being used, why we're seeing some more tillage and such. And that's our, that's our challenge going forward, is how do we handle residue? How do we get as close to no-till as we can? Because for us, if we stay in no-till, what no-till does for us long-term, particularly if it's continuous no-till, it gains us an inch or two of water during the summer. And for us, that's huge. Our soils hold about five inches to begin with, if we can get an extra inch or two, that's phenomenal for us in terms of our yield increases. Yeah. Um, so in places we have a lot, a lot of wheat goes behind corn, and with fusarium being in the corn stalks and then breaking the head scab to get the right conditions, you know, we have some folks that had maybe thought that tilled ground didn't have near the head scab that some of the no-till did when you're behind corn stalks. Okay. Really good question. I'm glad you brought that up. So he's asking about if you've got corn, will ha corn will have fusarium on it. Obviously, the head scab fusarium, the same organism, can, can be an issue that way. And so if we do some tillage, 
will we reduce the head scab threat that way? The answer is yes, if you're using a mallboard plow and burying all of the residue six inches. Then yes. But if the big disc or the single plow that can take it. No. If you've got any residue left on the soil surface, no. Now, the other side of that equation is our pathologist, Don Hirschman, several years ago, this was a big concern with no-till versus till, several years ago determined that our fields are relatively small enough and they're scattered enough that we've just got so much of the inoculum in the air that what we're doing on an individual field doesn't matter that much. Okay, you get out into the Dakotas and they're farming two and 300 acre fields, it matters. But for us, it doesn't matter. We're, we're, getting, we're getting enough inoculum spread around and we're just swamping out that issue. And so you could go back and do that deep tillage with the mullboard plow, bury it all, three fields over, it's blowing in. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In, in general, we got a pathologist in the room? I'm safe. All right, good. In general, when we talk about trying to manage residue and, and keep inoculum down, you've got to actually bury that residue. And, and basically, a mullboard plow is the only way you're going to do that. So that's, when we talk about tillage to reduce a disease risk, that's how we do it. Yeah. Good question. Okay. Get to the cookie. They had them outside. Uh, soft red winter wheat. Most of you in the room probably know this already, but most of our wheat is going into things like this. Cookies, cakes, pastries, donuts, all the good stuff, right? And so that's, that's commonly where it goes. As I mentioned before, you can find, uh, you know, McDonald's uh, biscuits, uh, Walmart, those type of places. They're buying some of our wheat uh, and putting it into food products. But we've also found another source. And so far, we're the only ones that have done this, which I find kind of interesting that I know of. We have found one other source for some wheat on a smaller basis. Are you laughing at me or did you just get a good text? Okay. All right. Well, how good is it? This is a, you know, this is an inter interactive group here. I mean. Oh, well, okay. I wasn't going that anyway either. All right. Let's get back to the less controversial topic here. The, uh, our other alternative for wheat. Is, uh, we've got one brand of bourbon that has soft red winter wheat in the mix. And so when, with bourbon, it has to be at least 51% corn. And then the other, you can have other small grains that go into that mix. And so we've got one brand of bourbon, which is fairly, fairly common, or fairly popular, uh, that grows some, some, or buys some winter wheat. Uh, and so it'll, they'll stick it in a barrel for about six years, give or take. And at the end of the day, What's wheat going for right now per bushel? I had to ask the bad question, didn't I? Five bucks. Okay. So each one of those bottles is about 30 if you retail it. And so that's the, uh, yeah, so if you want to, uh, you've got a credit card on the floor right there. Um, so anyway, so we do have one source. Now, before everybody wants to go jump on that market, we've got one farm. That supplies all the wheat that they need. Now they're growing. They're growing. They're growing about seven thousand acres of wheat, but they clean all of it. Everything that goes to makers is basically seed quality. It'd be stuff that you'd you could buy and replant. They obviously watch that pretty closely. They buy all their corn from about three producers, and uh, those three producers grow about. Uh, Wow, is that right? They grow about uh, 50,000 acres of crops between the three of them. So, wow, that is right. Okay, all right, back on this. I put this up here more to remind me, am I missing some other questions that you all need to, to, to be asking at this point? All right, everybody looks good, so we'll scoot, scoot on. So those were the numbers. Let's get into some more of this. Um, pay attention all season. These are some critical aspects here. At the end of the day, when we calculate yield, yield is basically kernel number times kernel size on an area basis. You all sell it on the volume, right, on a bushel. 
But what happens if test weight's low? It takes more seed to make a bushel. What else happens if test weight's low? In our area, what happens to the price? Price goes down. So they're adjusting for that, for that weight. And so we sell a volume, but they're paying us on the weight. That makes sense. And so tiller number, that takes place back during stem extension, uh, right about feet six, right about jointing. Head size occurs pretty early on. That can occur back in the winter. Kernel number, kernel size, those are taking place somewhere around jointing and then a little bit later as well. And so with a weed crop, we've got to watch it all basically from, from start to finish if we're going to try to maximize that yield. And so that means about nine passes across the field, from planting to harvest, everything in between, we're looking at about nine different passes through the, yield, through the field. Those same producers that flip equipment every year, up until this year, uh, the companies loved it because they had places to sell those combines and tractors. They hated it because they, the farmers flat wore out the sprayers. And this is a lot of where the sprayer wear out took place. We're going across these fields. All right. One nice thing about wheat is we can have a pretty low stand and still get pretty good yield potential. And so 80% stand, still 100% yield potential. 60% uh, stand, we're still at 90 to 95. And so we can go pretty low on our, on our stand and still have excellent yield potential. And I think this is the reason this issue right here, this, this percent stand number, we can get some gaps in a no-till field. We can get some stand reductions here and there, as long as there's not too many of them. We can have excellent yield potential. We make up the difference. We've done some studies looking at wheat as it goes across the old corn row. We can watch that yield drop as it goes across the old corn row and pick back up. But when we look at the overall field average, the field does just as well as a conventional field. And I think this is part of it. Okay, let's see. Um, fall nitrogen. Uh, if it were legal, how common would it be in this area? Not very. Got one saying not very. Okay. Everybody else saying that's right. Absolutely. At this point. Okay. We'll move on from that. All right. All right. Twenty to forty pounds. That's usually enough. Um, we, in our case, we normally have enough fall in carryover from the preceding crop that we don't need it. A lot of our growers are going ahead and putting it on. Uh, if we start talking about earlier, let's, let's get past this one for now. Let's get past this. Okay, let's get into this. Late winter, that first application, first shot in the winter time, about feeks three, 30 to 50 pounds uh, if it's conventional, 40 to 60 if it's no-till. And that depends on tiller count. So if our tiller count is below 70, we'll put the higher rate on. If it's between 70 and 100, we'll put the lower rate on. If it's above 100, we put nothing on at this point. And uh, now you skipped up the weeds, but that's kind of the biggest area of the problem. Oh. Weeds? I did? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, right there. Yeah, we got a few in that spot right there. Yeah. Uh, What's the most common product being used for weed control? Harmony. Harmony, okay. You got any resistant harmony? Or resistant uh, chickweed? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's more, more dead metal. You know, yeah. Really yeah. Yeah, that becomes more of an issue. That's, that's a bigger challenge. Yeah. yeah. What's that? That's a bigger challenge. <laughs> <laughs> My answer is you brought the agronomist here, not the weed scientist today on that one. No, it, that's a big issue. The, the, um, and, and frankly, it's an issue that the, the cost of controlling weeds can really bring down the profitability of the wheat crop because you're talking about having to use multiple things in the field to try to make it work. So uh, another big bugaboo for us. And so for the rest of you in the group, they're talking about net, dead nettle, chickweed, some chickweed that's resistant to harmony, which we've got some as well. Um, Y'all have any ryegrass contention? Ryegrass is a big one for us. Uh, any anybody that grows wheat should never touch annual ryegrass. So some cheat, okay. Well, so we we've got a lot of folks growing ryegrass for forages, for cattle, for livestock. We also have some some of our 
Uh, programs for waterways and things like that allow ryegrass to be grown in those as well. And so as one grower commented to me, he said, well, I've only got it in my waterways. And I said, well, as long as you can promise that as you get to that waterway, you lift your head up and you never cut any of the ryegrass heads, then you're in good shape. And uh, but if you can't make that promise, then, then your game's about over. And so we're looking at things like going prowl early in the spring to try to hold it out, some things like that. Yeah. The, uh, you know, and the growth regulators, the two, four Ds, those types are other options for your, your dead nettle, but then that brings in a whole other cadre of risks as well. All right, late application, we're talking about final rates between 60 and 100. If you're in the high yield category, it's the 100 pounds, sometimes more, and 120 for no-till. The higher rate in the no-till is because of the residue. Is that the same here? Y'all deal with that same? All right. All right, let's get past this. Let's skip head scab. Okay, so I mentioned before, head scab's our biggest one. Uh, and uh, and as, as, was, as I mentioned in the last group, if you look at our yields in terms of our really high yields in particular years, that means we probably had a May that wasn't conducive to head scab. It means the May may have been a little bit more dry, maybe it was hotter than what head scab like, you know, that effect that kept our head scab levels fairly low. And so I think that's the situation. Now this year, this last year, we had 71 bushel wheat and a lot of our wheat had very low head scab but had very high dawn levels according to the testing kits at the grain elevators. And so there's some folks trying to figure out what in the world happened in that scenario. Uh, trying to figure out what's going on there. Whether, whether it really is high dawn, whether it was bad testing kits, something along those lines. Uh, those of you that deal with dawn, you know that most of the samples that get pulled out, you're talking about one or two kernels having a dawn hit, if you will, to take you up above that limit. All right. All right. So I, I've, I've kind of, up to this point, I've said, well, hey, no-till is a good way to go. Uh, we can still make it work, and we can. We get good yields, and we do. But if you look long-term, this is a rotation study by one of my counterparts. If you look long-term at his rotation study, he's got the previous year's corn yield graphed over the wheat yield. And what you see a, a line going down from left to right. And what that means is the higher your corn yield, the lower next year's wheat yield is in this particular study. And so there's, a, there's several things going into that. Could be weather, you have weather more favorable for corn, followed by weather less favorable for wheat. But it could also be the residue issue that we're all dealing with. And so that's one we've got to get, get our heads around. I'm going to skip past this one, go on past this one. Let's go into 15 inch wheat. Part of the attraction of 15 inch wheat over our way is the residue. Now I can use a planter. Maybe that'll do a better job of managing that residue. Give me a better stand, give me a chance. And so 2008, 2009, that first season that we tried it in some plots, we had pretty good yields. 97.5 versus almost 90. And there was a difference in yield there. Now there's two ways to look at this. One was narrow row wheat yielded better but the way a lot of folks looked at this was, wow, he got 90 bushel wheat in 15 inch rows. <laughs> and so a lot of our folks talked about it from that standpoint that that's pretty good yield potential overall. And so we did this for two more seasons. And the next two seasons when we did it, we had no significant difference. So statistically, we couldn't separate out these differences. Statistically, uh, it was predicting that these yields would behave, the or these treatments would behave the same the following year. But 2009, 2010, our yields were even a little bit better, up closer to 100 bushels. 2010, 2011, yields were down just a little bit. And in those scenarios, we're not seeing much difference. And so I think this is going to be similar to what we see with 15-inch uh, row beans versus 30-inch row beans, where most of the time, 15-inch row beans give us a better yield. On occasion, they yield the same. I think we're going to see the same thing here. Most of the time, narrow row wheat's better for us. There's going to be occasions where they play out about the same. Skip past that. Skip past that. Okay. And part of the reason I said it is this. These are looking at large plots uh, with a planter versus a drill. And uh, the other stuff I showed you was small plots. This large plots, we've got different seeding rates along the bottom. 
and the line that goes across is looking at 15 inch row wheat at those different populations. The yellow circle that you see is seven and a half inch wheat at our standard seeding rate. Not much separation in terms of yield. That's, that's two years, that's two years of data, that's six locations total over those two years. And so there's some pretty good data that tells us that 15 inch row wheat may may not be a, a bad option for some of our growers. Uh, where it may really work out well for us is folks that have got RTK equipment. You see some heads already, already beating me to that one. 15 inch row wheat, you can straddle the old corn row with an RTK system. And so in that case, you're not going to cross the old corn rows and maybe that's a way to get around the residue issue is to just to bypass the old corn root ball altogether and might get us some decent yields that way. So I think that there's some, some avenues to study this a little bit further. Before I jump off this, questions on this. Yeah, so what about the subsequent double crop bean yields? Did those do even better yet? The answer is no, we did not test that. Um, it, may, it, it would make sense that you should get a better stand if you can, can do that. And we've had a few farmers tell us that's the case. They feel like they're getting a better stand, but we've not tested it. It's a good question, Joe. Th is this a drill or a planter? In our studies that I showed first, it was a drill. And so we were just looking at 15 versus seven and a half. This, this study here, this is a drill versus a planter. Yeah. And the drill used was either a John Deere or a uh, Great Plains, depending upon the farmer. All right. Okay, let's jump into this. Just, uh, just out of curiosity, I thought I'd show these 2014 yield contest winners. We got our tillage champion, our no tillage champion. We break those out just out of comparison, out of interest to see how the yields do. And then we have th four areas that we also bring in in the state. And so we've got uh, six winners overall in a particular year. And you can see in this particular year, if you go down through this, only two of these were no-till for this year. So four out of the six were conventional till. And the majority of those were a single pass, either disc or a single pass vertical till implement that make that up. And so we're not talking about the old conventional till method, and we need to probably change that terminology. We're talking about a, a single tillage pass versus none in most of these comparisons. You can see we've got one in there that went at six inch rows. Most everybody else is at seven and a half. And uh, uh, this is 2013. Uh, again, now this case, we've got three no-till, three tilled, Pretty good yields overall, all of them seven and a half inch rows. And then if we go 2012, just to pull those in, we've got, uh, again, only two out of the bunch that are no-till, um, and the rest are, are tilled in this case. And some of the differences coming in that way. And now we've got, take a look at the one that's got the 15 inch rows in here. That's what I was looking for earlier. And so, if we look at this one right here at 15 inch rows, see 109 bushel coming off of that t off of that plot and so the, the wide row system can get us good yields in a good year uh, may not be quite as good as what we can get with the seven and a half but it is an option for us how big are, the how big are these plots these are uh, three acre harvested area three acre area so majority of these growers are not growing these fields for the wheat contest that makes sense they're they just happen to be good fields. That, now they, they've got good fields, and so they'll they'll push those fields, but they're not particularly growing them just for the wheat contest. That's right, that's right. Which makes this probably a little bit more of an interesting test to look at than some of the others in that regard. Okay, he's giving me the nod. That means it's time. All right, thank you all.